All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another Sunday conversation. This week, we are shining the community spotlight on District 6 Supervisor Matt Haney. And if you're new here, we welcome you to this platform. We gather in this virtual space every two every Sunday at 2 p.m. covering a, a wide range of topics. You can also join us on Tuesdays as we highlight black and brown businesses and community leaders, or on Thursdays where we bring you educa educational presentations on various topics. Our special guest for Tuesday will be announced shortly after today's conversation. And Thursday, we'll be covering insurance with Shamira Furman. And just some quick little introductions um, to your panelists for today as we get started. My name is Jada Curry. I am the Director of Programs here at both sides of the conversations. And the co-hosts uh, for this conversation include... I'm Rico Hamilton, co-founder of Both Sides of the Conversation. And I'm John Henry, co-founder of Both Sides of the Conversation. And for those joining us on Zoom, you can add to the conversation through the chat function or by raising your hand to be brought up as a panelist and have the ability to unmute and speak. Um, for those on Facebook Live, we will be checking the comments to include your input. And with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to John to just give us another overview of our community standards. And in that time, we also ask that you share this video, start a watch party. We definitely want as many people to be included in this conversation as possible. So John, you can go ahead and take it away. Our community standards is today is and always is both sides of the conversation. We're providing a safe and honest space for open conversation. Please be respectful of that. Please be respectful of all the panelists, hosts, and participants. Healthy debates and healthy conversations are encouraged. Please do not personalize anything with anyone. No name calling, no bullying, no trolling, no shaming will be allowed here on our live webinar, even in our group as well in our Facebook group. Your perspective is yours. It is not a prescription. You don't have to agree, but you must show respect here on both sides of the conversation. What we're doing is trying to create an open forum for dialogue, for healing and education. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Rico. I just wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, we got an amazing uh, individual who's doing some amazing stuff in this district uh, and citywide. Um, I, I follow this guy very, very close. Uh, to just see a lot of the amazing stuff that he got going on. He's very inclusive and in making sure that uh, his constituents and the city um, individuals are, are getting what they need. And, and he, um, in my opinion, he, he follows what's going on so that he can gain better perspective. And, and I'm just happy to have him on, John. I think that, you know, the more individuals we can have on and, and kind of just have an in-depth conversation to better know them, better um, educate the community on who these individuals are, the more we get perspective for our city and we, we get good leaders to do the amazing work. So without further ado, I definitely want to introduce our, me and John Guy, <laughs> uh, Mr. Matt, Supervisor Matt Haney. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for being a part of both sides of the conversation. Thank you. Well, it's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, you know, John Henry, Jada, Rico, um, I get to see you, you, all of you a lot kind of informally, and I see the work that you're doing in the community. Uh, I know we've been volunteering a lot together uh, over the last few weeks, and I see you in District 6 all of the time. So it's just really an honor to, to be here with you. And also just I want to thank you before we start out uh, for creating this platform. And it's so important that uh, we have these dialogues, that we share information. You know, too often elected leaders are very disconnected from regular people and not everybody's going to tune into SF Gov TV and <laughs> I don't recommend it most of the time because uh, that's not always also where the real conversations are having what is actually going on and so uh, I just really appreciate um, and actually the first thing I know Shaman Walton was on here and he said you have to go on this conversation they want you on there and I really want you to go on there so uh, apparently he had a good experience when he was here, here with you all and um, I'm just honored to be invited and, and to have a dialogue with y'all. No, definitely, definitely. It's a blessing. I mean, that's what it's really all about. You know, we're just trying to be that one extra hub. You know, we have a lot of ways and forms to get in communication to the community. And sometimes community feel that our city officials or city leaders, they don't get that communication for whatever reason. And uh, just having an additional hub of information going to the community here at both sides of the conversation, we kind of connected to all the districts in the city. So we definitely been trying to reach out to all the supervisors to come on. Um, it's a good way to talk directly to the people um, and answer some of the questions. And, um, you know, we're just trying to be respectful. We want to educate and we want to help, right? Bring that insight. Uh, a lot of times people in the community feel that 
Um, sometimes the leaders have lost touch or lost the tone and don't understand the real needs. And it's a blessing to have you to come on and really, you know, take some of the information in and give back to the community. And I just want to commend you to, you know, one thing about leadership in, in any facet is it's always about our word. And, um, you know, you reached out to me, you said, hey, I'll be there no matter what, you'll figure it out. Um, you said you was going to come out to the city each feed. You was there. You was there on Christmas. You see the need. So that that just shows the people that you get it. You know, you see it. You out there have, handing out food, helping them out, talking to the people. And I think that's one of the uh, qualities that I like when city officials, you know, are open. Because it's hard to get to you guys sometimes through the, <laughs> the, the different channels. So just when you do have those highlighted times to be in the community, just to open up, take a second, talk to the young person, talk to the adult. And it's hard, man. But I appreciate you for that. Um, you know, I just wanted to highlight that. A lot of the parents that we work with in the district, uh, in your district, is just impressed about the change, the things that's coming there. So I'm just happy to have you on, man. Thank you. It's an honor. Appreciate that. Yeah, no, Shaman told us that you definitely have an open door policy. Like, you know, <laughs> we, we, yeah. we know about his open door policy, but it's happy <laughs> to hear that you definitely had an open door policy because many yeah. times as community, I might know you and I might be the link to other people. And sometimes things happen and then that link, there's a disconnect because now I have an issue with someone and I'm not giving the information to them. So I just like the way you and Shaman are, 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 have that open door policy when it comes to come on in, you got my number, I'm gonna definitely reach out, I'm gonna definitely support. So I call Shaman for anything, he picked <laughs> up, and I'm like, you know, that's a, that's pretty cool that you can have folks that you can reach out well, to. Today and answer. Before we get into it, you know, me, Shaman and I have had a, a journey in, in public service together. Uh, both of us ran for office at the same time for the first time and we didn't know each other. So we basically ran against each other for, for school board. And, um, and, and I would hear him talk and, and, and I would say, hey, well, they, that's actually a really good point. And we just kind of developed this relationship so much so that on the evening before the uh, election day, we were out there together dropping each other's literature together. And, um, and I ended up winning that race, but literally the next day I called him and said, well, you're running, you, you know, please run again. I will go all in for you. And then he, he started inviting me with his crew in, in, uh, in Candlestick at the time. And I remember the first time I showed up, they were kind of like, wait, this is the, this guy, you know, isn't this the guy we don't like because he beat you? And, you know, and Shimon was like, no, you know, and, and so he has become like a family member. And then we got to go on this journey together, both running for supervisor at the same time. We were president and vice president of the school board together. So I think that's, you know, that's how public service and leadership should be. And, and even in politics, right, it doesn't have to be, you know, if people are trying to do good things and they're trying to represent people and they're trying to make a difference. It doesn't have to be, you know, about conflict or how do I get over on this person? Uh, you know, when Shaman does well, when his district does well, when the people in his district do well, that's a win for all of us. And that's a win for my constituents who are also connected to District 10 uh, and, and, and vice versa. And so um, I do, I, I like to kind of, I, that relationship to me is one of the things that I'm most proud of um, in my time as an elected official, because a lot of times, we just end up, you know, even between politicians, right? Everything is just, you know, competition and, and trying to, you know, make somebody else look bad so you look good. And um, if we can figure out how to make it so we all win, uh, that, you know, that 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 would be better for for everyone in our city. So, um, just a word about Shaman and 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 you know our relationship and friendship. No, that was uh, amazing, uh, especially when you said how the districts uh, intersect, right? And what's so cool is, is like, so I'm the coordinator uh, with my day job uh, with the Street Violence Intervention Program. I'm the coordinator for the Western Edition Tenderloin Soma. And your district literally is the most, in my opinion, one of the most diverse districts in the city that's made up of individuals from all over <laughs> the, the city and that intersectionality. So it's like, to see you in different districts doing the work, it, it, it seems more intentional that you're really trying to better figure out the individual opposed to the, the demographic. It's like, okay, let me, let me figure out the individual, where they come from. Let me see what the Western edition actually looks like, the Bayview and some of these other places so that you can get more of a holistic approach to how you're dealing with the constituents. I don't know if, that, if that's true, but definitely that's what I'm perceiving out when I see you doing other work and you're connecting with other communities and trying to figure things out. 
you know, I think that the district that I represent, which includes, you know, the Tenderloin, South of Market, Civic Center, Treasure Island, is often the place in our city that both operates as a sort of an intersection, but also is the place where when people have been displaced from other districts, when they've been failed by other districts, um, not just by, by the districts, by the city as a whole, um, this is where they end up. Sometimes that's a good thing because they got housing and sometimes it's a place they come because they have no other options. And it's a part of my district that I'm in some ways really proud of because we are that last place for people before they're pushed out of San Francisco, people in District 6, organizations in District 6 say, no, we need you here. This is still a home for you. And when people leave the city altogether, they come back to this district. You know, I, I, you know I, I, when I used to be on the school board, I would walk around and I have all these like t-shirts and shirts and um, sweatshirts from different high schools, you know, and, um, and uh, even high schools that like don't even exist anymore, Woodrow Wilson, you know, places like that. And I'll wear, wear them and uh, people will stop me on the street every, you know, because this is a place that is still very San Franciscan and people here are from all over the city, especially. Um, and so I, I also take that responsibility in how I work with other neighborhoods and other leaders and, and the responsibility that all of us have for the success of the people who live in District 6 as well. Because if you're from the Mission or the Fillmore or Bayview or, or you know, wherever in the city, you have a, a connections and relationships and friendships in the Tenderloin and in the South of Market. And, and, and what happens here is, is gonna be connected uh, to, to what happens there. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Jada, I know she lives in your district and I know she has some questions. So we will let Jada just go ahead and ask a couple of her questions that she has for the people in her district. Great. Yeah, yeah, I would say um, I definitely never thought of it the, the, the way that you just posed it um, about this is like the last place before almost like people leave the city because I, I know that was true in the case for my family. And now here we are living in district six. So I think that's, that's very true. Um, and so just a kind of little bit of background on the work that you've done. Um, so here at both sides of the conversation, we've touched upon the topic of like the school to prison pipeline and reformation of the school system. And knowing that you auth um, authored the safe and supportive schools policy, what are some of the successes of that policy that you could speak to and, and let us know about? And, and even about the policy itself, for those who don't know. So this was uh, a, law, well, a, law, a policy that we passed at the school district in 2013. It was the very first thing that I worked on when I was a, a school board member. Uh, we worked on it together with Coleman Advocates uh, for Children and Youth in a, in a broad uh, coalition. Uh, and at the time, San Francisco Unified was suspending uh, over 2,000 people, uh, kids a year. It was still suspending elementary school students. It was suspending students for willful defiance, which we in 40% of the suspensions were for willful defiance. Um, over half of the suspension were of black students. And uh, they had no uniform policies around making sure that you actually try to support a young person Get, get, get to understand what's going on, use positive interventions before you did something punitive that often meant pushing them out of the classroom, pushing them out of school, and sometimes pushing them into the juvenile justice system. So we wrote a policy to completely change all of that, to ban suspensions for willful defiance, uh, to require positive interventions at every uh, uh, school level, to have specific targeted approaches as it related to preventing uh, the, the over uh, reliance on suspension of black students, and expulsion, and we made a lot of progress. Uh, we cut suspensions by over a half, over 50% in the time I was there. Um, we cut uh, suspensions of black students by even more than that. Um, every school now has to use positive interventions. Um, we, cut, we dramatically reduced expulsion. So that, that work, which was really community led, you know, at the time, you know, was actually a somewhat of a, of a fight. You know, they, the, the school district didn't want to do it. And, and now we sort of like, yeah, obviously you use restorative justice, you know, use restorative practices uh, for, for most things um, because you actually try to mend relationships and understand what's going on. And that policy that we put in place in, in San Francisco has become the model for uh, school districts all over, the, uh, all over the country. You know, there's still a long way to go. There's still far too much reliance on punishment of children and exclusion of children. But we changed the, the conversation and we completely changed the policies and 
dynamic, I think, in a very powerful way. And, uh, and, and for that reason, I think, you know, for me, it's always, if you walk into a school, then the first thing has to be for a young person, do they believe that those people there care about them and their success and their well-being? So if they're having a bad day, if they're struggling with something at home, if they're experiencing trauma, and the first thing is get out of here or something is wrong with you as a young person, well, that's going to backfire and that's going to not make them want to pay attention in math class or anything else. And that's an experience that far too many of our young people, especially black students in our city have, have in our schools and have for a long time. So we made a lot of progress through that. There's a lot more that needs to be done. Last thing I'll say, we, we, um, I was so excited that Kevin Bogus was recently elected to the school board because that policy was Kevin Bogus and I working together when he was at Coleman Advocates and now he's on the school board. So that's just like, he's going to, you know, take it to the next level as well and hold those folks accountable. So, um, yeah, but I appreciate that, that question. If, if people are more interested in, we call it solutions, not suspensions. And there's, if you go to YouTube, there's a 30 minute documentary that was done on this policy by Kevin Epps. Uh, and uh, you can check it out. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, tells the whole story of what we did and why. That's pretty cool. Uh, the, the other thing is the flip side of it, keeping that policy intact, right? Because now with the Zoom school, you know, people use Zoom as the, the education portal. As we get back to normality and people are going back to school, we have to watch those numbers so that teachers and schools are not suspending the kids again because they can use Zoom as an alternative measure. You know, we just don't want to, because now that people are learning how to do the Zoom thing, I just, sometimes when things come and play like that, it, it, it sometimes affect the community because then, you know, we'll start suspending kids again, but we'll be using it on the benefit of, hey, now they have Zoom. So they technically still can learn why they're not there, but then the rates and the disparities continue to happen. So that's that's a good thing that we need to definitely push and stay behind. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. And yeah. I'll hold off on my other question. I'll let, I'll let you and Rico go. Go ahead, Rico. <laughs> So, um, so I've, I've noticed a, a whole bunch of stuff that you have going on. I mean, maybe um, it'll be good if you can just highlight some of the stuff you got going on. I like the painting that you guys did down there, uh, Trans Lives Matter. Um, all, I mean, like you have a whole bunch of stuff going on, or especially the stuff around the homelessness that's going on down there. Uh, we know that there's a huge population of um, uh, underserved people who live there um, that come from all different type of nationalities. Um, maybe you just highlight some of the things that you have going on around the homelessness and talk a little bit about the, is it a transgender cultural district that's down there? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So if you could talk about that, I, I know those two amazing things that we would love to hear more about. Yeah, I know. Definitely. Um, uh, so, you know, obviously district six uh, experiences a lot of the challenges in our city, even to a greater degree than, than most other places. Uh, part of that is because of what I what I spoke about in the beginning, which is the city has used certain parts of this district as sort of a way to uh, push uh, problems or or challenges or people who are struggling, um, you know, away in in into this part of the city, um, and and the result of that is that we have over half of the the people who are homeless in the city or in this dis one district. Um, you know, sometimes I hear about some of the other districts. Um, you know, who are talking about the homeless problem that they have. And I think, well, we have more people who are living on the streets in one block than their entire di district. Uh, so it's, you know, we do have, it is the biggest challenge here. And then there are a lot of the other associated aspects of it. We have uh, a drug addiction and drug overdose crisis in our city, which doesn't get talked about enough. And I would love, love to talk about it with you all here. Uh, we are on track for over 700 overdose deaths in San Francisco this year. Two years ago, it was 240. So we are going to nearly triple the number of people who are dying from drug overdose on our, on our, on our, in, in our city. 70% uh, of those deaths are, are connected to fentanyl. And fentanyl is hitting our city in a way that I think, you know, we haven't really had a reckoning around. And over 700 people dead from overdose and 130, or the latest was 139, I think, from COVID. So you, you look at the, the, the difference. And again, we have to be responding aggressively to COVID, but we should also be saving the lives of, of, of these folks who are 
uh, experiencing what is really an illness when you're addicted to a drug like that. And so we have that. And then we also have mental illness. So all of these things are, you know, for me, end up being my, my top priorities. Uh, how do we make sure we have enough supportive housing and affordable housing? How do we get people off the streets, you know, into a pathway to housing? Um, so I've really fought for the, the shelter in place hotel program. Uh, we have legislation this week to uh, make sure that we keep those shelter in place hotels open and that we keep on bringing people inside to get them on a pathway off the streets. Uh, you know, in, 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 in District 6, we also have a, a huge uh, challenge around mental illness and untreated mental illness. So, you know, Supervisor Ronan and I authored a mental health SF to really transform our system of, of mental health care. We came to an agreement with the mayor around it. Now it's the, the policy of the city to actually have, you know, coordinated care for every person who has mental illness that hasn't been happening before. And the result is people fall through the, the cracks. We have a street response team where people, instead of sending the police out, when somebody is clearly sick with a mental illness, you send social workers, you send professionals who can help, you know, peer, peers even, to help understand how to de-escalate and get that person help. So those are now being deployed in District 6. Uh, and so all of that, I think, as we think about people who are often from San Francisco, people who have been failed by our city for, for so many years, how do we have a coordinated, connected system of care for them to get them off the streets, to get them real health care and, and, and support and treatment, and then over the long term, be able to sustain in housing? And so that's a lot of what my work ends up being here. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mental Health SF, the, the shelter in place hotels, the navigation centers, um, you know, the programs around uh, reducing drug use and overdose um, are a huge priority of mine. Um, I would say also just one other thing that my district ends up taking on a lot of the development and growth as well. We have most of the tech companies here, most of the large growth of commercial office space and that kind of thing. So one of the things that I did early on last year is when those big office developments come through, they have to provide more funding to support affordable housing. Because if you bring 10,000 new employees and all of those people are coming in, and, you know, and they're going to increase the cost of housing for everyone else, we need to invest more as a result of that um, uh, uh, in affordable housing. So we increase the jobs housing linkage fee, um, uh, which will help to invest in that. Um, you asked about the, the transgender district. You know, the, the, the Tenderloin is such a diverse place with like an extraordinary dynamic history. It was, we have the transgender district here because this was the place of the Compton cafeteria uh, riot where you know, people, you know, trans folks used to go there. It was their home. It was their the place where they could be. And the police came as they often did and harassed them and attacked them and, and brought violence on them. And so they fought back and they, there was actually a huge, it was, you know, before Stonewall in New York. And so this has long been a refuge for a lot of people who were kicked out of other places, who were discriminated against, who experienced violence wherever they were. And they came to the Tenderloin because they could build a community and be safe here. And it's a really in contrast to a lot of the ways that people think about the Tenderloin. They think about the Tenderloin as kind of a bad place where bad things happen. Well, in reality, uh, bad things happen to trans people in a lot of other places. And they came here because they could find some level of refuge and solidarity with each other here. And that was true also for people from Southeast Asia. There's a lot of Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian people here, uh, and a lot of other communities that have found a home uh, in the Tenderloin. And, uh, and so that's the, the, the genesis of, of what is now the trans cultural district here and you know, helping to invest in their ability to stay here and, and thrive here you know, today. Go ahead, Rico. Oh yeah, no. So I just want to do a follow up from the from what you were saying about the homelessness and the mental Ill illness. So I uh, I'm a recovering addict. Uh, I have over 20 years clean now, um, and in San Francisco we don't really fund 100% abstinence based programs. For some reason, I don't I don't know why there's not a lot of them that get funded, and I believe that there's none because most of everything has to be like 100% harm reduction, which I I do believe in the harm reduction model, 
Um, but there's some components of it where it's kind of a, a gray area coming from the attic perspective um, on, you know, sometimes or a lot of the programs, you don't have to be 100% abstinence. And it does jeopardize the life and the illness of other individuals because we know triggers and all this other stuff that we have to pay attention to. So are you like, so I know that, uh, I don't know if you know Steve Adami, but there's a lot of stuff that's going on around that. Um, trying to figure out how do we support those individuals who need recovery and real recovery. Um, what are your thoughts on, because I, I like in my head, I always think what, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, <laughs> right? So when it comes to mental illness and drug addiction, sometimes the chicken come before the egg, sometimes the egg come before the chicken, and it just depends on which individual you're dealing with. So sometimes it's, it's the mental illness first, and then they're using, or it's vice versa, the usage causes a mental health issue. So I'm trying to figure out like how do, or what are your thoughts around uh, harm reduction and how, do, how can we infuse 100% abstinence-based programming also? Because I don't think that it's a one size fit all. I think it's kind of like a holistic approach on how we address um, addiction in San Francisco. Well, first of all, thank, thank you for the question and thank you for sharing, you know, um, and, thank, and, and congratulations, you know, on your, your journey. And uh, I think we need, you know, we need you to share that more and, and that experience, both having been able to go through recovery and also the value that actual uh, 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 abstinence-based or real recovery uh, programs have for you, because it is, a, it is a, a frustration that I have with the way that our system works currently. And I think you said it perfectly. It has to be both. It has to be an integration of the two approaches. We have to make sure that when people are using currently and they're not yet ready for treatment that or recovery, that they, that they survive, that they are not getting themselves sick or others sick and that they are not overdosing, frankly, uh, and that they have the education in order to, to survive because you cannot get somebody into treatment if they're dead. They, we need them to be alive. With that said, we have to take every opportunity that's possible that comes in front of us to, to try to reach somebody to change their behavior in a, in a, in a bigger way. Because what, what we know is that, was, especially with the fentanyl, you know, this is, we actually, I just had a hearing on this last week. Fentanyl is different. You cannot do harm reduction for something that if you have a little bit in it that you thought was this much, but is actually this much, it will kill you. you it, it's a different approach to harm reduction, even than it, what, than it is for heroin or other types of, of drugs. So what we need to do is take every opportunity we have when somebody might be open to it or available to it to offer them something more. And one of the things that I'm really disappointed in our city on I talked about the shelter in place hotels. We have 2,400 people in these hotels. Many of them do have, are struggling with substance use. Every single one of those people should receive counseling and an offer of treatment, you know, recovery-based treatment. And I was at, on Thanksgiving, I was at Salvation Army Harbor Lights. They told me that they have uh, over 40 empty beds and haven't got a single referral from the shelter in place hotels. They can't even get a call back you know, from, from the city. So we can do the harm reduction. We have to do the harm reduction. We have to make sure there's Narcan, that people know the dangerous, you know, way to check the drugs they're using so that they know how much fentanyl is in it and all of that. But we also have to ask them, hey, come in here and talk to a peer about, about getting clean and, and offer incentives for that. Because if someone is going to do something over and over and over and over and over again that we know is likely to lead to them dying if we don't intervene, I think we have a responsibility to intervene. But we also have to keep them alive until that moment. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I, you know, and, and I would love to work with you on that. You know, I'd love to, I'd love to talk more about this because this is something that I think is really broken in our system as it is right now. There are people right now, I live on Hyde Street in the Tenderloin, I just walked and got coffee. There were dozens and dozens of people out there using right now. I don't think I've ever seen since I've lived here, just people out there walking up to these folks and saying, 
hey, do you, do, you, do, you, do you need some help actually to get out of this? Instead, it's, do you need a needle? Do you need Narcan? Which I support too, <laughs> but can we do both? <laughs> you know, so. Right, I, I think that's a valid point. Um, I'm glad Rico brought that up um, because even when you address the mental health issue, and I know, you know, it's a lot of people advocating for mental health and funding for mental health. And I have to agree with Rico and some of the other people in the community that when we are having crisis, the support and the services are not there. I have people all the time reaching out to me. They call the 311 number. They can't get a hold of a therapist. People are not returning their calls. How do we fix that? Uh, because it seems like the only crisis intervention is when the uh, police make contact and somebody may be homeless. But what about the people that's dealing with violence, uh, victim of violence? the families, um, the people, we need people on the street when these crimes are happening in the other communities that they're getting support too. And, and having these resources that people could go in and feel comfortable that there's, that there's there, you know, they, they could get the service if, if it's 24 hours or whatever. And I think that's one of the things that needs to happen um, because it just, it just seems like it's a lot of mental health but the results and what, what we hear from the community is just not matching up to what the service providers and the need, you know, it's just, it's some disconnect and we just got to figure that out. So the, the, mo most of the things, m most of the things that people need help with or that people need help for their family members or friends with, we don't offer, which is the, the most ridiculous thing. You know, most of the things are not, you know, somebody is hurting themselves this moment or going to hurt somebody this moment. I need the police. Most things are actually not that. Most things are also not somebody is physically hurt at this moment. I need an you know a a a, a, um, a uh, an ambulance or the fire department or whatnot. Most things are more that I know that this person who is close to me is not doing well, and if we don't do something now, it's going to get much worse. And I need somebody to come and help with that. And our system is not right now built for that type of response. And the result is that we end up getting to the emergency level or the fire department or the ambulance or the police when we didn't have to. And, and then using those things for, for things that are not appropriate that sometimes they make worse. You know, when you call the police for somebody who is really just, you know, needs actual help, that is when things sometimes go wrong or, or, or the police actually escalate things or, I mean, it's, so I, I really do agree with you. And I think that that's part of what we're trying to build with Mental Health SF is how do you get 24 seven real time responses for people who are either with substance use or mental illness in a crisis or, or just need to be, you know, through a peer or whatever it is, need some help. And that's, that's really, it's not happening. Uh, it's real. I've had people call me just like what you're saying and say, you know, my brother is going through it and he's having, you know, he's having certain episodes. He's not taking his medication. I've called, you know, doctor, I've called 911 and like nobody's helping. And as a supervisor, I have to say, I don't, I don't, I'm not exactly not sure who you should call. Uh, I don't have anyone uh, in particular that can respond to that. And that's for, so for anybody who, you know, doesn't even know that what is out there, it's just nothing available. Yeah, I have a, 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 a family member who suffered from uh, bipolar schizophrenia uh, and it's super hard to navigate through the system. It's just very, very hard. Um, he has certain episodes and when he's going through those episodes, it's scary. You don't know like what's going to be the response. You don't know who can become a victim of whatever is going through their mind. Uh, they, and what I did notice was that he, he's more afraid of the people around him than they are of him. So, you know, certain movements, so, and I've learned like over a period of time that I got to be very gentle and just kind of like let kind of support in the way that I can until we can get them to a safe space. But the fear causes the harm because the paranoia is causing him to freak out and go through this psychosis where he feel like everything and everyone is trying to harm him. And I think that part of that is even with the drugs. Cause I know that 
um, uh, folks who use crystal meth, you know, over a long period of time, being up for six or seven days, like it, it puts you in a mindset where now you're seeing things, <laughs> right? Like the trees look like snuffleupagus, right? So like, you know, I, I've been there, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's connected and it's often connected, you know. Um, you know, there, there, there's a guy I've been trying to get help who, who I knew when he was in, in, in middle school. We, we, you know, I've known him for a long time um, and he's out on the street now and his name's Steven and he struggles, he has bipolar disorder and he has depression and he, you know, he has, now he's off his medication completely and he's also using meth. And so all of that is combining just to have this just, you know, awful impact and he can't, he isn't able to make really decisions for himself. Um, and it's really hard. Um, it's really, really hard. Um, and I think that we have to have understanding and, and compassion and, and empathy. Uh, and sometimes in our city, we look at people like that and we, you know, I get it, unfortunately, a lot in my, in my district, people say, you know, the zombies, they call, you know, they dehumanize them uh, because we as human beings, it's hard for us to even process that people are going through that and that we're not doing anything about it. And so we have to dehumanize them even to accept for ourselves walking by that, right. you know, person. Uh, you know, and that, that, I, it makes me very sad about our city when that's what it's come to, that we were so, you know, desensitized to it, that we are dehumanizing people in order to get through our day and justify, you know, not being ourselves in constant state of sadness and trauma, uh, you know, and, and we all do it. I mean, like I said, I live, I live in, on Hyde Street where it's, you know, as bad as anywhere. And, you know, yeah, I, just like everyone, sometimes I have to walk by people who, you know, are because I don't know what to do. Uh, and it's, it's just, I wish for our city you know, and I hope for our city that we, we can, we can get to a place where that's not what happens, where at least we know what to do. We know who can help. We know who to call. We know who to alert and something will, will respond in a, in a, in a positive supportive way. You know, when I see someone out there, I'm like, I don't even know who to call and they wouldn't come. They would come in three hours or otherwise call the police. What are they going to do? It's just like, I, Right, right. I, I think it's really taking a different ap approach to to the way that we do the work. Uh, when they when we start practicing harm reduction um, back, uh, I think this is when I first start going inside the county jails. This is a while back, um, and I start hearing about it. And I'm like, wow, this is an amazing practice. But how do we? Because sometimes, like as a big city, sometimes you take on best practices from other places and kind of try to adopt it to your city. And we know cities are different. Like the individuals, the culture is a lot different. So you just kind of like throw it in there. And we think that it's actually, uh, in my opinion, sometimes it causes more harm because we're not looking at it from a lens or, or from a lens of sociably on how the culture and the people in our communities are, what things we need to pull out of the model and what things do we need to add. So I think like like in, in 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 what you were saying previously around like bringing it together, I think definitely like like that's going to be really really big as we move forward, um, especially in a lot of the districts districts where there's a lot of homelessness and a lot of it is caused because of mental illness or drug addiction. It's like how do we look at that model and create our own from the model and say, look, this is what we created for San Francisco, in support with the model that came from Amsterdam. Um, so I, I, that's, that is kind of how I kind of see it, that like, how do we do that? Like, how do we look at our own city and take bits and pieces that apply and that don't apply for us? Yeah. And just, la you know, last thing, one of the things that makes it hard and I and this part of it, I, you know, make makes sense is there is a very negative history around this, around criminalizing uh, drug use ar around the, you know, the drug, the war on drugs. Um, and the, 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 you know, the racism that was associated with that and the, all of the harm that it was, that was done. And so when people are thinking, well, you know, we need to do something different and we need to try new things, there is sometimes a reaction that, oh, so you're saying that, you know, you want to, uh, lock people up or, or these kind of things. And, 
It's like, no, no definitely not. <laughs> you know, I get that, you know, but how do we get to a place where we are, we, because, because we don't want to do incarceration, we cannot go from incarceration to indifference. And that's some, in some cases where we've ended up here, I think, um, that there's a very anti-incarceration approach, which I also would agree with, but I also feel like it's left us paralyzed in terms of what we should actually be doing. And right now, uh, you know, what we're doing is not working. I have a quick question. So, you know, um, what is it? Uh, log cabin. Let's turn log cabin into the first county jail school campus. It'd be just like an uh, 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 <laughs> enclosed school campus that's just like a college. And instead of imprisonment, it's uh, more of a, a school-based model where, they're, yeah, they have to stay there, or like a boarding school type model where, yeah, they have to stay there. But instead of them being rehabilitated in a negative way, we're rehabilitating them, taking them towards education and empowering them to become something. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> we... You know, I, my understanding is that log cabin isn't being used for anything right now. Uh, they, 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 and, and, and somebody says they'll teach there. Well, that's fantastic. Um, actually, Shaman and I went down to the log cabin a few times when we were school board members because there used to be kids there. Uh, I, I don't believe that there are still kids there, uh, but it could still be used for something maybe for adults uh, that would be a more positive opportunity. And, you know, some of the kids who were there did okay at log cabin um you know there were some positive things that happened there overall i think it wasn't the right environment for children but for some adults yeah the long cabin is, is long gone yeah it was it was there it was still open when i was on the school board so it's not that far long long gone i think i was there and maybe visited in 2015 um but um yeah it, it's gone now but it uh but the city still owns it is my understanding Definitely. Um, Jada, Jada got a couple questions from the group. She got a couple questions as well. We'll uh, just pull in some of the questions from Jada. Go ahead, Jada. Yeah. So um, Gloria Berry, she asked, um, can you please repeat the information about the place that has 40 beds? I think that's the Salvation Army that she referenced. Yeah. Salvation Army Harbor Lights, um, residential drug treatment. Uh, they have short term stays, but they also have long term. You know, you can stay there for, for up to two years. Uh, and a lot of people transition from, from Harbor Lights to job opportunities and other types of placements. Um, uh, Theo Ellington works at, at, at Salvation Army, so people who know him can reach out to him. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, um, you know, it, it was sad to see that they, they said, they actually told me, we want more people and we don't get enough referrals. And most of the referrals that they get are through the jail and through adult probation. Um, and I think we need to better integrate referral to programs like that from, from the street and from DPH and from the shelter in place hotels, places, navigation centers. Um, you know, if you go into that program and you take it seriously, you know, it's a pathway to, to, to stability and recovery. And there are other programs like that. HR 360 has a bunch of programs that are like that residential treatment programs. Um, generally, you, you do have to be uh, sober in, in a number of those, uh, but not all of them. Yeah, Jada, can we get that information put in a chat and then throw it into the group, whatever the website is, just to help the people out? <clears throat> yeah, for sure, for sure. And um, one of my last questions, um, I was thinking, you know, when, when Rico was sharing the story about his family member, uh, me, simu similarly, it's the same thing with my brother, very similar. It's almost like listening to my own brother's story. And um, thinking of his situation and you talking about the mental health um, SF initiative, um, how will that initiative work with the criminal justice system? And I'm, I guess I'm asking this question because I'm thinking of like, in the particular case of my brother, how he was formerly incarcerated and he has to kind of deal with the system in a certain way, but it's often not as helpful as it should be. And we're quite often told, you know, talk to this person, talk to his probation officer, talk to, and there's not really results. So how will that, how will that kind of initiative deal with folks who were formerly incarcerated? Uh, well, you know, first of all, I'm sorry that, um, you know, that, that you and your family are, are going through that. Um, and I, you know, I wish the best for your, for your brother. 
um, you know, uh, I, I think one of the things that we that that led us to to pursue mental health SF was both the the way that the the, the response system on the street was broken and that people weren't being referred uh, to intensive case management. They were being taken to SF General and released with, with just a piece of paper at best. Uh, that's often what happens if you get 5150 on the street, uh, you go to SF General and uh, they might keep you for a short amount of time. And most of the time they'll release you with a piece of paper, uh, that's it. And, uh, and so you see people walking around in their hospital clothes and people being cycled in and out. Well, the same thing happens from uh, jail health services, from, 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 from the jail. Uh, the handoff that is taking place between our uh, treatment si uh, system, our case management system for people who are experiencing substance use disorder from the jail to the rest of our system is very weak. And so what we did was we're creating an office of coordinated care and we were very explicit that it has to have staff at the jail who who ha so that we have one single coordinated system where the treatment that you're getting when you're when you're incarcerated or you're within oversight of the of the system, including through adult probation, that that is connected and coordinated effectively with the, the broader system, because right now, uh, you know, and and the treatment that folks are receiving in the jail, uh, you know, in that situation is 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 not. Uh, I don't want to, I mean, the people there who are there are doing the best they can, but it's not sufficient at all. And the handoffs are terrible. Uh, the connections are terrible. And so people are released. We see in my district, people walking around in jail clothes uh, and, and you know, clearly mentally ill. I mean, and, and there's no connection there. So, um, so I hope that we can improve. Mental Health SF is meant to coordinate that care, including between jail health services. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we visited at, at 850. The, the, un, the they have a, um, they had before. Obviously, thankfully, most of that is closed. But they had a, a unit there that was for people who are addicted to drugs, and it was just awful. I mean, you, you, you felt like you were in, you know, a hundred years ago or something like that. That, that that's where these folks are getting treatment. I mean, it's just like, we should be, you know, it looks like Alcatraz in there, you know, and that people were still living in there and that they were trying to treat people who were mentally ill in that environment. It's just like, I don't have to have be a clinician to know how ridiculous and, and backwards that is. So I feel like we're beginning to, to unpack that and improve it. And we need to be able, you know, just last thing that I will say about this part of it is, we also have failed people for so long and they've been traumatized and they've been violently abused by the system. And for us to be able to create a system that works means not only that we have to do that for people moving forward, but it has to be a system that is strong enough to go back and, and be there for the people that we've done so deeply wrong. And that's going to be really hard. Because and, and that, yeah, that's that's definitely deep. You said that because I was leading in kind of some of my second question. Um, you know, I know a couple of uh, some of the leaders in the city has talked about um, reform when it comes to our nonprofits and our agencies. And I think it's a real topic that we need to have in the community. And how do we get leadership about you know, making reform and making some changes because we, we can sit here and identify where some of the shortfalls and the struggles are, but not having um, that same type of support and understanding from the community and our community leaders who really have the power to impact and change. How do we create some reform to get some new ideals, to get some new things for the, for the city moving forward? Because a lot of times what happened is, I call it the, the effect of, uh, the community, uh, like the community um, rappers, for say, let's just say we got a lot of respect for the community people that knows people, but sometimes don't have the the wherewithal and the intentional information to actually make change, right? And it it's frustrating because you know here it is, you know one of the comments when you talked about you know having the resources and the information to give to people in the community, you as a leader. And that's, that's a struggle for information. Me as a community activist, 
I'm seeing uh, a lot of the same issues and struggles with resources and information. So how do we intentionally make the communication better, have a better campaign, not saying that people are not doing nothing because I hear it all the time. Well, hey, I do this. Hey, I do this. But then there's still a large pocket of community that don't know about the, the, the programs or the nonprofits or what the people are doing. So how do we get intentional with the communication? How do we make better campaigns for our public people that's working in the public safety sector that, so that we have this information, whether it's we making these emergency cards or information for people offices or to the community websites. I mean, and that's what we're trying to get here. We're always open for people to send us information so we can get it out to the community for people who may, may not get it, but how do we do that? Because it seems like the, the biggest loophole of this is communication from the city to the community and from the community to the city. So how do we fix that communication? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of these these programs and um, and approaches and uh, and you know policies and all of that that unfortunately sometimes they're designed more for the bureaucracy itself than it is for the people who are supposed to interact with it. And you, all, you should always, you know, one thing in, in the interest of of, of sharing, you know. Um, things for people to look up and, and look into. You know, I had the benefit of, uh, of being able to study something called human-centered design, um, which is also sometimes called design thinking. Um, and I spent a year sort of learning about this and implementing it. And, you know, it's a very basic idea, which is, you know, if you're going to design a solution to something, well, first of all, you should start with identifying what the actual problem is and the need is that you're trying to address and then work backwards to, to figure out whether the solution that you've designed is actually working to address that. Don't just be like, oh, I got my solution and um, it's going to work no matter what. Well, what is the need that you're trying to address? And, and then talk to the people who are impacted uh, first and foremost to understand what the need is. And then if you roll something out, let folks interact with it and then change it based on how they interact with it. You know, if they if, if they don't see it, if, if if you have this wonderful program that looks great on paper and in a pamphlet, but nobody shows up, and nobody's showing up to those beds, like like I told you, well, then you probably need to change what you're doing. To and and when you're changing what you're doing, generally what you need to do is get deeper and closer to the people that you're trying to touch with what with an impact who have the need that you're trying to solve for. And I think in government. You know, a lot of times we're not operating that way. It's 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 up here, you know. At worst, it's for it's people operating for them and their friends to enhance their own power and access. You know, we've seen some of the worst of that, obviously, recently in our city. But 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 sometimes it's less, um, you know, malicious than that. It's just that like they've sort of designed it for themselves and their own kind of where they're at. And anyone who's on the ground could tell you it's not working. So we need to improve that connection at all levels. Uh, and ultimately, we have a lot of resources and a lot of money in the city. Like if we could just get a little bit of a closer connection between the people we're trying to help and, and the programs and, and resources and opportunities that exist, as you're saying, maybe a lot more will happen. There's people who are addicted to drugs on the street right now, but they don't know about these things that we're talking about, you know? Um, and so even, even in examples that are not that extreme, just, you know, the city needs to be here for the people who are here. This is another just thing I would add on this. Sometimes the city is, because we're San Francisco, we're thinking about how we look to other places. We're thinking about how we look to the media, how, how we look to visitors, how we look to big companies, how we look to whatever it is, people we want to ha attract to come here and everything. And that's really important. But like, let's start with how the people who live here experience the city and, 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 and what is happening here. Let's judge ourselves based on how our people are doing, not on the next big whatever, whatever, you know? And I think that we sometimes get into this mode where we're just, you know, this is not, I'm not, I'm not subtweeting one leader or anything. This isn't, we all do this. I do this, right? I mean, we all do this. But how do how do we, we 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 get back down to how our people are doing and 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 go from there? And I do think 
you know, with COVID and, and what is happening here with a lot of people leaving and we don't want anybody to leave, but if people are leaving by choice, that's their choice. We should be more people, more concerned about the people who are being forced to leave. But the people who, who, are, who are here, maybe we have another opportunity now to, to really more deeply make sure that they're doing all right and that the next phase of our city and its future are really a positive quality of life for, for all of us here. Man, that's that's pretty deep, and uh, I know me and Rico committed to working with you on that. I mean, this is what this platform is about to help with that communication uh, process uh, because it's definitely a need uh, when it comes to that information. I mean, I heard Gloria uh, come on here and ask that question earlier. We had them on a couple of weeks ago with our veterans, and um, that's another struggle that they talked about. Um, you know, the veterans on the street, a big part of San Francisco homeless population are veterans and how to connect those people back with the VA and getting information to them when they're in the streets is uh, very important. So it all kind of ties back into all the kind of the different communities, um, that lack of communication, trying to tighten it up, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of community efforts going on to make it better. And uh, we all are part of it, community as well. And it's letting go some of our ego, passing the torch on, get behind some of the young innovators, some of the young energized people in the community, supporting them for change and uh, being open and flexible, I think is a major thing that we need here. So definitely willing to work with you on that, Matt, in the future. And, uh, you know, just happy to have you open to different ideals, man, because sometimes people get in these boxes and it's, those boxes hold us back. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, none of us have all the answers, um, you know, and, and, and that's another important thing, which is that, you know, we all have some things to learn and, uh, and, and even somebody who's an expert on something, they can only do well on their area of expertise if they're deeply connected to the people that they're trying to impact. You know, that's, that's what makes you an expert because you're willing to be open to be taught and to, and, to, and to process information. You know, to me, leadership is about being willing to, to, to listen and be open to new information and then use that to be better and do better. Uh, it's not knowing the answer, you know, at the beginning. <laughs> you can't just start out and be like, I already know exactly what, no. If you're a leader, are you willing to be adaptive based on what the people that you're trying to do something positive for are telling you? And our systems of, of government need to constantly be reminded of that, uh, including our, you know, elected officials. And, um, you know, sometimes we, we get to a level where we, we're afraid of that, you know, because we think it will show some level of vulnerability. You know, well, oh, if I if I if I act like I don't know, then I'm not doing my job, or I'm not this or that. You know, it's like, you know, you, you know, not knowing and saying you don't know is a part of good leadership because that 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 means you're willing to 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 do better. So I oh, think that was powerful. That was powerful. Go ahead, Rico. Yeah. So. Uh... I do just want to read this uh, comment from uh, Mr. Nate Ford. He says something amazing. I definitely want to read it out loud. Uh, he says, supervisor, I have to say that you are a sincere and committed person. Again, I don't know you, but first impression is everything. I appreciate your thoughtfulness and your down to earth approach, as well as being real attitude. Very refreshing. So, <laughs> and, that's from, and that's from Mr. Nate Ford. Mr. Nate Ford, you know, He's yeah. been one of the pillars in the community over there in the Western Editions and citywide, because I know he deal with youth everywhere, uh, but most notably in the Western Edition. But coming from him, you know, it, it's definitely real. And you definitely give that feel uh, that is refreshing. Uh, hopefully, you know, people can look to you um, as what a supervisor should look like, just in terms of like, you have a personality that's kind of like, I'm open. Not, I know everything. It, it, the, it, it's more like, okay, wow, I didn't see it that way. How can I adapt to that and, and bring it in or hone it in to serve the community that I'm, that I'm uh, serving? So, Nate, thank you for your, uh, for your kind words, man. Nate, I appreciate that. I, I just want to say one thing real quick, uh, you know, because this is both sides of conversation. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. You know, okay. you know we're about, we're, about, we're, about, we're about having both sides of the conversation and being real um, because, you know, community has a lot of questions. Me and Rico get a lot of questions. Yeah. And um, one of the, a couple of the things in, uh, um, in the community, you know, there's this, um, 
issue with with public trust right now and um, we understand with all of the scandals and different negative things that's happening in the city um, I seen your news interview when the city manager stepped down for a while to deal with some personal stuff um, and I think that was commendable uh, I mean I know some people didn't really like that that she stepped down and I thought it was like you know the kind of the right thing to do right because coming out of this four years of this presidency that we have right now you know, how do we bring back the ethics and morals back to our city elected officials, to our politicians? Um, because there's a there's a distrust in some of the community. We don't, uh, a lot of community feel that uh, the, the the officials are not, you know, holding by what they supposed to and delivering. So people don't trust the, trust what's going on, right? From, especially when you start dealing with the stuff brought over the news with, with corruption, different things. How do we bring back that peace? How do we bring back that, that, uh, it, it removed that anxiety from the people that, hey, there are people here trying to deal with the issues to make things better. Um, because I think as a city, I think as a country, we need that because the ethics and the morals right now when it comes to politics, politicians and, and, and our elected officials, it's, it's, it's very shaky. And I think the community is having this disconnect with our with our leaders and don't want to engage. And I feel like uh, accountability is a lot of it. And I appreciate a lot of our leaders stepping up, taking accountability with things. Um, go wrong, but how do we put that back in there and get that trust back that, you know, we're all as leaders working together. Cause I think of the, my ideal of, um, you know, when we educating people, me and Rico, we have a, a mentoring program here. We, we think about how do we teach our young people, right? And, and it's seeing us do the things we need to do. So as officials, how do we behave and unite and work together so that the community see it? Because I think sometimes in the black and brown community, we are people of show me people. We have to see it to believe it sometimes. That's just kind of our cultural thing. And sometimes when we see dysfunction within our, our, our leaders, I think that, that dysfunction rubs off to the community as well and have some dysfunction. So how do we tighten that up to let the people in the community know that, no, we unify, there's differences, there's always things come up, but how do we unify so people understand that, you know, we have some leaders that's taking charge. Well, uh, I appreciate the question. I do think that uh, you know there is a there is a, a crisis of, of trust in in political officials and in government. You know that's been there for a long time, and I think that you know Donald Trump has made it worse. I think that you know this is a period of time in San Francisco where it's obviously gotten worse. You know for a number of reasons. Um, and I think that for me, it's, it's been hard because on the one hand, I really share what you're saying, which is, it makes me really mad because it, when you have that sacred responsibility to serve the people, especially in San Francisco, where I will say all these folks are paid pretty well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> these are, these are, these are high level people who are paid well, you have a sacred responsibility and when you, you, you abuse that trust and that responsibility, that also reflects on a lot of other people. And it makes it a lot harder for us to do good things that need to get done when people lose that trust. And people lose hope and they, 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 they lose an interest, and, and you touched on this, they lose an interest in participating because they get cynical. They're like, why would I deal with these people? These are all crooks. Like, you know, why would I deal with them at all? So it has very widespread effects and, and consequences. And I do think there are certain forces that want us to be cynical, that want, that want regular people to be cynical so that they don't get involved and that they don't, you know, try to participate. And that leaves the crooks and the big money folks and all of that to just run things however they want, because they, they'll tell you everybody's a crook. Well, if, if you think, and the people who are listening think that everybody's a crook, then the crooks are gonna win because they just run things. There's no, there's no real people to come in and try to actually participate and make things work better for the people. So I do think that we, we can do better. And part of it is what you're doing here, which is the access and accountability with officials, whether they are elected officials or, or other members of our government, so that they that we're actually required to say, well, what are you doing? What do you, what do you think about this? Do you actually have solutions? Um, and how are you showing actual results? Uh, you know, and and then and then I think that you know this is a bit of a again a 
an inflection point for the city and county of San Francisco, both with regards to what's happening out with COVID and, and how that's affected the city, but also with this moment for public integrity and, and ethics. And I, I hope that the set of people who come in set a new, a new and, and I don't, and I don't I, there's one thing I'll add, it's not just about the people who are being charged with the FBI and all that. If you look at one of the things that, that is also happening right now, the, the, the black city employees have been coming forward, suing the city, challenging the, the structures that have failed them for years and basically whistleblowing on the entire broken structure of, of, of the corruption. And so it's not just the what's happening in the news and all of that. There's actually a whole process right now that is going on as relates to everything you've been saying. This city government should be connected. It should be accountable and it should work for the people. And that, that, that's like not too much to ask. <laughs> You know, um, so I, I think it's an ongoing thing, but I just, as I said, I do think we have an opportunity right now. And I think that it comes from more sunlight, more accountability, more participation, like what, what we are doing, you know, here. No, definitely. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's scary. You know, I read the article with the, uh, the you know, the person that held those accounts when people make claims and, um, you know, people complaints were thrown away and different things of that nature. And it's just like, yeah, uh, you know, reform. It's a lot of change. <laughs> And, I mean, it just Terrible. needs to happen, you know, and, and I know here sometimes they think I'm a little radical and I just want to ask you this, Matt, because I think what's needed is we need more term seats and we need more uh, ways that when, when our officials get in there, they get an opportunity to bring in some people that could do something, right? Because sometimes you get a new set of administration coming in and they stuck with the old people or people that's already been there or people, you know, from a previous administration or they already have their own thing, right? And you have to come in at a new supervisor and work with these different people who may have been holding a department seat for 40 years, you know, and they already have their way of doing business. How do we make it where these seats, some of these, because because my, my belief is this, if it's a public seat, the public should vote on it. And I believe that we need in this country, not just locally here in San Francisco, but throughout the country, we have to find a way to dismantle the way these processes are happening. You know, giving people access in public seats to elect, you know, put people uh, in seats. Um, I think it all should be voted by the people and we shouldn't have no lifetime seats. I mean, even when it comes to the federal judge level, because what happens is some of the core issues in America with systemic racism is tied to those seats our constitution and things of that nature. And we have to be able to, to adapt and change to make it more effective for the people in the times we in. And I know term seats get mad at, a lot of people get mad about when we talk about term seats um, because this is people livelihood. But again, uh, my perspective is you know what you're getting into when you come into public seats and we need to keep the ideals and information fresh so we don't get stuck with a hundred years <laughs> of the same things that's going on. And it, it's just being real, you know, you look at our country right now, the same people of 50 years ago to now, and it's like, what did we change? The same house and Senate. <laughs> it's not changing. And it's time for, in our politics, this, this political environment that we're in, it's time for the community and people to step up and ask for change. We need something different. And I just think it's, 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 it's this is the time when everybody's talking about reform defunding, whatever it is, diverting funds, however they want to pronounce it to make people feel comfortable. We need change, you know, and uh, I think term seasons might be one up part of it. I don't know how long the term should be. I mean, I think that's the conversation that we should have, but how do we keep these people who, you know, are been in their seats for 40, 50 years and they divisive, you know, and they don't want to work with the community. I mean, we in this pandemic right now, and I feel like a lot of these people are playing pandemic politics with people's lives. We have a lot of people out of work with homelessness, and we can't get the basic bills done to take care of people. And, and, and we're too far behind in this country when it comes to uh, the disparities, you know, with income and wages and with, with all this gentrification. And it's like we're not seeing the real effects and dealing with it. And I think that's a conversation that we need to have. But I just wanted to throw that out there and get your thoughts on that uh, for the term seats. <laughs> you mean for for uh, uh, elected officials or for uh, for judges or? or? I, I think I think we should look at term seats for all of our public elected seats. I yeah. think it's, it's it's time to look that way. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I, I agree with you. I'm, uh, I'm only given two terms. So, uh, well, yeah. So, although some people come back, and, you know, we had uh, Aaron Peskin who did two terms and then took some off and came back. But uh, most supervisors will serve just two terms. But the, the uh, and same with the mayor, but the other seats in our city, uh, uh, obviously some of those folks can serve for, for a long time and serve a number of terms. Um, you know, I think term limits are, are good. I, I think, you know, it, 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 it leads you also to have some level of urgency about what you can accomplish in that amount of time. And, uh, and then obviously having, uh, you know, the, the, the turnover and leadership is really important. And so I, I would definitely support term limits uh, we don't have term limits, obviously, for Congress, but I don't see why we, you know, we'd have it for other things, but not for Congress. It would be good to have some more, you know, new leadership in, in all of those seats. Yeah, definitely. I think that's definitely something that's needed. Rico, you want to go ahead and jump in there? I thought you was trying to say something. Yeah, I definitely, you know, hey, you know, there's both sides of the conversation. <laughs> so what I did want to say was in San Francisco, we just came off an election year and with the election year and the pandemics, everybody was in the race, everybody was in the fight, you know, for who they want and, and all that. And I think that a lot of times with politics, um, the race actually gets so ugly that it we, we become more divided, right? So I'm trying to figure out like, how do we unify, right? We know about the corruption and all that stuff. To me, in my opinion, it looked like the Democratic Party is so divided at this point. In my in my, this is my own personal opinion. It, I, it feels like there's no, we're not together. Everything is kind of all over the place. We have all these different subgroups of the party, and it, and it get kind of confusing. <laughs> and 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 that's also another reason why a lot of people don't vote um, is because it, it's like a lot of it is like, oh, that's a bunch of crap or whatever. Um, how do we unify as a city um, around um, educating folks on government? But then how do us as San Franciscans, if we saying that we are this, um, how do we stick together and always show that unity? Because the community, one of the questions that, that we had, and I was kind of like, well, I don't know if I want to ask Matt that, but it is both sides of the conversation. I do want to ask it because it was given to us. So it's a perception. And this is just a perception. And this is what the person is saying to me, that uh, the perception is, is that you and some of the other supervisors has a have a funk with the mayor. I don't know, but I definitely wanted to throw it out there um, because if our mayor and if our supervisors aren't standing together in my opinion it looks like what happened with obama and the senate and how he couldn't really get too many things passed it looked like the same thing with trump and he feuding with this so it it, it kind of looks like that same thing but on a local level so the question is how do we unify uh, city government and making sure like a lot of people because this is a perception so that means that th this person okay. sees this so we want to be sure that that isn't seen uh, in people's eyes um, when they look at local government. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the, um, the question. And, uh, you know, I, I don't obviously have any problem with it being asked or, or, or any issue answering it. Uh, so I, I do think it is, it is an issue in San Francisco where we are, we are more divided than we should be because ultimately there is very broad agreement on what we're trying to accomplish and who we are and what we care about. You know, we, the differences between us are very small. Uh, generally, when you compare to other parts of the country that, you know, where in a lot of parts of the country, it's like, you know, there, there are people who, who are, who, who actually think to say black lives matter is like a terrorist thing, or, you know, it's like for us here, it's like, we're all, you know, but so the responsibility that we have is then in San Francisco is, to take the things that we say that we're about and the values that we share and turn them into outcomes and results and real solutions for our people here. And I think that sometimes when we are fighting so much or 
and, and even if it's if it's a perception that uh, that that the outcome of that is that it actually makes it harder for us to deliver on those solutions together, and it makes it harder for us to work together. And so, I do think that we all have to do better on that. Uh, you know, I I you know to answer your question in part, I I also have to balance that, and I take that responsibility very seriously. I have to balance that with the fact that the people that I represent in District 6 have been failed in many cases by the city and have been excluded and left behind. And all of the questions that you all have asked about the lack of accountability, the issues of ethics, the issues of lack of responsiveness, right? Like, like so I have in some ways developed a reputation of being kind of kind of hard on the city government as a whole, which is often the executive branch. You know, you know, it's not, for me, it's not personal, but you know, for, for the Department of Public Health to not, you know, to, to be releasing people out in the street from SF General with a piece of paper, uh, that makes me mad. You know, that, 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 that is something that I think I have a responsibility to channel on behalf of the, my constituents, the, 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 re, the anger and the frustration with the failures of government. Uh, and, I, and I do think that especially with my district and in some ways with you know, the person who's gonna represent district 10 or district five or the, the parts of our city that where they have a lot of people in their, in their district who have had that experience with government that I'm going to express that. And to me, that is not, that is not about who the mayor is. And honestly, it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't really matter to me who the mayor is. <laughs> Part of my job is to bring that, you know? And if it would have been Jane Kim or Mark Leonard or whatever, I was gonna, I'm gonna bring that. Because if, if, if I'm not, then I'm not doing my job. But also a part of my job is to work together and try to solve these problems together wherever and whenever we can. And I gave the example of Mental Health SF, where we had our proposal and the mayor had her proposal and we fought some publicly. And then we sat down and we said, let's do this together. We're all on the same page. And we both support the same funding proposal for it. And it's, we're, we're, you know, and there's gonna be disagreements and such, but we are moving together with a solution. So I think that that's always where we want to try to end up, but also we have to stand up when we feel like government is not, you know, working for people. So, um, you know, and, and, and the mayor herself, I've, no, I've known the mayor for, you know, 14 years, probably. We, we used to organize together and do events together and volunteer together for, for years and years. Um, there is no, you know, personal uh, animosity in any type of way, but as I hope you can, you know, you, you can understand is for, for my district, for the Tenderloin, for South of Market, for Treasure Island, especially, they, they need um, somebody who is both willing to work for solutions and also willing to stand up and say something is not right and to call people out when necessary, necessary and be righteously upset at the failures of, for, of people. And I'm trying to balance that. <laughs> um, but uh, I hope that we can get, you know, when you talk about unity, there's no question that, di that disunity, that, that division, especially here where we have so much in common is, is ultimately not going to get us to a better place. And it's going to make a lot of people not wanna be involved. It's gonna, it's gonna, you know, we have to be bringing people in not pushing people away from, from the public process here. And I think a lot of times, you know, it's the leaders, but it's tough. There's a lot of money here, you know, and the money comes in and plays a role too. There's millions and millions of dollars. You know, I had a million dollars spent uh, for my two opponents, some of which was used to attack me when I was running and in an independent expenditure. And you know that make that's 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 hard when you go through that, right? Some of it was from the police officers' association and all of that. So when that's always there, the, the money also, the big money causes some of the division. That I think if that wasn't there, we wouldn't be in those type of fights because the money, the the big money comes in and fuels the division. You know, twenty attack mailers. You know that exploit all sorts of fear and stuff. You know, a lot of it is coming from them, not even coming from the, the elected officials themselves. Yeah, because uh, those um, 
elections get brutal. <laughs> they, get pretty, <laughs> they get pretty brutal. They get pretty brutal. Uh, and it, 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 it divides the community. Um, not just the individuals within the community, even the relationships with the potential supervisors or whatever, um, because we all have our own opinion who we perceive to be the, the pick. But sometimes those mailers and sometimes the fuel that's being added, now I don't like you because you're with this, like, you know, and, and, it, and then when it's time for you to serve, there's a awkwardness that's kind of like, mm, I don't know if I want to work with that guy or I don't know if I want to work with this person. So, you know, like, how do we get past that? It was an election. It's a part of the game. Now it's time to move forward. And now how do we work with each other? I, I will say, which hopefully gives people some some level of, uh, you know, perspective about it is that um, at least for this board of supervisors currently, uh, we don't have a lot of that either with each other or even or even towards the mayor. I mean, there's the public sort of back and forth and such, but, you know, if the mayor or the mayor's office was like, we need, we have something we want to work with you on, or we want to talk to you about, or we need a quote, or come and meet with us on this thing, I'm there, you know, like it's where, you know, and similar, even with some of my colleagues who either supported my opponents or I supported their opponents, even in this current election, but they, they won, we're fine. Like, uh, you know, we, 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 we will sit down and work together and we're already working together. And so it's always there, but I will say that I feel like there's some, some more positive aspects of it than even than it may seem publicly. Like, I think that we are all actually have done a decent job of, of looking past some of those sort of, you know, even political battles that we fought with each other. Right. Um, you know, I'm no hard feelings between me and anyone else. And, and I think vice versa um, on, on the, on the board. I, this, this, this board, I think, in my opinion, is one of the most progressive boards that's kind of more have the progressive thought of like, okay, how do we think holistically and how do we think San Francisco as a whole? And I don't think you guys are more like, oh, it's just about my district. It seemed more like you guys collectively as a body look at San Francisco as a whole and, and give, in my opinion, give each other the input that you need to actually uh, create good stuff for San Francisco. So that's what I've noticed when it comes to the board. Seemed like a pretty good board. Uh, I think so. I yeah, think. yeah. You yeah. know, I'll definitely let you know. You'll hear me on one of them calls talking smack. <laughs> right, and I mean, as you, as you should, you know, and, and call us out. And sometimes that is also our responsibility. You know, if the executive branch, you know, a department or whatever it is, is trying to do something that we feel is wrong, you know, we could tell them directly and we do. And then they still try to do that and we might have a public fight about it, but that's kind of part of what we need to do. Um, and, and, you know, if we're doing our jobs, I mean, the thing is, if everything was working great for the people I represented, then this wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> then right. I wouldn't have to fight or anything. But on the other hand, the issues are so important that if they try to do something, the executive branch or whatever it is that I feel is really not going to serve people well, I also have a responsibility to to stand up and to and to fight. And uh, you know, and, and as part of what making making government accountable to to residents is, they expect me to do that and. And some, you know, I, I, I'll just give an example, you know, the, 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 the city, the department announced that they were going to shut down some of these shelter in place hotels. And so we said, well, that seems like a bad idea. It's COVID is spiking. You know, it's cold and wet outside. Seems like a really bad idea. So, you know, we uh, did a whole public thing about it and introduced legislation. And they've now changed the timeline and they aren't going to uh, shut them down at least for a few more months, maybe longer. And so we were able to, you know, some of that kind of back and forth, I think, led to a better outcome. So, uh, you know, whereas I think if we just sat down and said, well, let's try to figure this out without the public, you know, back and forth, right. <laughs> we probably wouldn't have got them to, to change their, their path. 
All right, definitely. Uh, one one quick question I wanted to throw in there um, too while we're here. We have you here. I think this is a good question for you to ask. Last Sunday, you know, we had our black and brown dad experience. Um, we had our uh, single fathers and co-parenting fathers here uh, on, on a conversation. And one of the challenges um, that a lot of the men talked about was with the family court system and child support and um, how do we come together and come up with some family reform? And I'm, I know we're going to reach out to the, the district attorney too. Um, how do we get some real reform in that area so that our men of the community can be connected? And I, I, I think it's a time to relook at um, the way the system is set up and operates uh, for, our, for our fathers of the community. And um, a lot of guys talked about that. And, and that's one of the struggles that's kind of impacted um, the black father and uh, brown father experience here in the city, especially when it comes to how penalties are assessed, you know, getting opportunities to be involved in, in, in their child's life. Um, how could we uh, do something? Or was, is that something that you and other supervisors would be willing to, to have some kind of um, legislation or come up with something to kind of have that system re-looked at and how we evaluate and assess uh, for our fathers, because we need our fathers in the community. And that's one of the challenges that they're face is uh, through the courts and the child support system. So I uh, wanted to ask that. Well, uh, I appreciate that the question. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, I, that I worked on when I was at the, on the school board is we passed a policy. Uh, I, I authored a policy as it related to how we better served uh, students who had incarcerated parents. And one of the really important things that has now been implemented with that is the ways in which our school system is working to uh, keep uh, fathers and, and, and mothers connected with a child's education, even when they're incarcerated. We now have, and we didn't do this before, they actually have parent-teacher conferences that were, hap that were happening at the jail. And, and, and that happened as a result of the, of the policy that we wrote and trying to make sure that our systems, and, I, and it, that's not obviously the whole solution, but I wanna just give that as an example, which is that our system should, should be built to keep that connection and relationship strong and, in, and intact uh, rather than set up to, to, to cut it off. Um, Shimon Walton and I used to go, we went on a couple years on, uh, on Father's Day um, out at, uh, at, at San Bruno, and they have a, a big event there where kids come in. Now, what I think uh, another aspect of it, and, and this is just particularly on the on the um, issue of the uh, impact of incarceration, the the there was a recently a, a state bill that passed that is is I know that our DA is implementing here, which relates to caregiver courts and actually having a special set of you know a judge. Who, ha who, who has a special set of tools at their disposal it, when somebody goes into the system who has a child or in custody or partial custody of a child should be dealt with differently because the incentive should always be not to separate families where, wherever possible. But then, and what you're speaking to is after that, when, you know, how do we make sure that the policies that exist, particularly as it relates to sort of post uh, uh, penalties, child support related, actually are trying to support families to stay together and support fathers and mothers to be with their children and be able to take care of their children, rather than putting more and more and more penalties and more and more and more fines and all these things that actually make things way worse. So I, I, I would be interested, you know, in, in terms of the specifics of uh, and, and I would love to, uh, you know, for the, for, the, for the fathers who were a part of the conversation last week, you know, would love to meet with them or to have a, you know, a round table uh, and, and to figure out what might be some policy solutions to that. Because I think that very often th these systems, they actually make things worse because they create more separation. They, they add to the, you know, that they, they actually are the cause of, of the hurt rather than being a part of the healing and, the, and, the, and, and, and building up people's relationships with each other. And that's, I think what, you know, you could, you could shut down jails and we will and you shut down juvenile halls and we will, but if the system still is built in a way that's built around punishment and blaming and penalizing and separation, it's gonna find a way to still do a lot of harm rather than 
find a way to do more good. Yeah, that's cool. I see uh, some people in the comments. Jada, we'll let Jada go ahead. We got like 30 minutes left or a little under. Um, we want to get some of these questions and answer. Um, I did see a comment from Cheryl Davis. She said, Karen Rowe uh, from Child Support Setters will be interested in a project like that. So hopefully we can get you guys connected. And uh, Shaman and a couple people, because we know in our black and brown community, the dads are affected. And um, just trying to make the experience a little bit more uh, transparent and sustainable yeah. so that we can yeah. get our dads, our dads involved with our youth, because I think it's important. However we do it, I just think that's something important. So with that, Jada, go ahead. I see we have some questions and answers here that's in the chat and we could get to those. And then let's try to grab some of the comments from the group um, because it is 3.30 and we got 30 minutes left. And Matt, thank you for being patient. Um, but we want to try to get through this real quick and make sure we try to cover as much as we can, Jada. Yes, so the questions that we currently have on the, um, the, the, the Q&A on the Zoom, have for the most part been answered. Are there any particular ones that you see on the Facebook live feed? Uh, let me see. I see Nate said something about the nonprofits at the bottom that we covered at. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I just see people talking about the Black City employees. I see Gloria said something about that. I think yeah, we could. I could ask them that too. Um, you know, with this pandemic, Matt, um, a lot of the city employees are uh, getting hit with notices and layoffs and uh, cuts for the uh, pandemic. How do we help protect our, our city workers um, with, with, with benefits? Um, I know a lot of the, uh, I've know a couple of people from the MTA reached out to me and uh, some of their struggles is, and some of the other city departments is, it seems, and this is the perception of some of these African-American city workers that a large number of the African-American and Latino workers for the city um, are not getting, you know, the full-time employment. Um, they're getting hired, put on as uh, temp workers. And um, when, when things happen, they don't get the same benefits because they temp workers. Um, that disparity seems to keep coming up across our country uh, where this is the new uh, perception of uh, large corporations, city entities and, and, and uh uh, employers that that's the game around, you know, not giving full employment, uh, making people part-time to have numbers to say, Hey, we hiring black and Brown community. Um, but they're not getting the benefits of uh, full-time. And then with the pandemic, it seems like, um, the resources to help support some of these departments to keep up and running is not there. Is that something you could speak to or, um, or is it things going on behind the scene to help, um, fix those issues? Well, it's, it's finally being discussed, I think, a lot more publicly. And uh, each of the departments now is, is required to be more transparent about their data, come up with plans to address the inequities in their department. Uh, really, you know, you know, these are the kind of things that in the past they might have gotten around, you know, and hidden their, their racial inequities by part-time employment and those kind of things. Well, now, especially, you know, we have an Office of Racial Equity and I know, um, you know, under the Human Rights Commission, I know uh, uh, Director Davis was on and maybe listening and doing really incredible work there uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, we, are, we, are, we are holding each department in, in our entire city accountable. There was a hearing a few weeks ago where each of the departments had to present on their data and then also present on their plans to address it. And you know, what, 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 what we saw was something that black employees have been saying for a very long time, which is that black employees are paid less, they're promoted less, they're disciplined more, uh, that, you know, that they're less likely to be in, in leadership, they're more likely to be in part time, um, all, all, all of these things, deep, 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 you know, disparities and inequities at every single one of those levels. Uh, you know, and, you know, you talk about MTA, you know the, the rate of, of discipline that that you know that black employees are experiencing for the same things where other people are not getting discipline for it um you know just a lot of inequities and then not being promoted to higher levels so i think that you know creating a structure of of data transparency but then regular accountability where they have to measure and demonstrate their progress you know you talk about you know show me not tell me well show us how this is changing and, and these disparities are, are being re reduced and set goals around it and, and, and all of that. 
And so I think with the Office of Racial Equity, we have a real opportunity to do that in an ongoing way and, and for folks to really be held accountable. And I think that at, at, at our uh, Department of Human, uh, Human Resources and our you know, EEO and all, all of those, that there's a, there is a set of kind of, I would say, reckoning that's taking place around the ways in which those uh, structures have not uh, been effective at a deep level in, 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 in changing these cultures and, and outcomes. And I know that there was a, um, a commitment also made by the mayor on, in a number of different things. There were six or seven sort of clear recommendations and commitments that the mayor made on, the, on this. So, you know, we, ha we have to stay on it and not just move on to the next thing. You know, I think that's a real thing is sometimes it's like, well, this is getting attention right now, but then, you know, five months next year, we're not talking about it any anymore. And I also think that Black employees are, are uh, very organized right now. There's an association and they, I've met with them a couple of times and they, you know, there's, there's a lot of focus on this and they're building, you know, uh, uh, relationships of accountability with elected officials as well, which I think is really important. Oh, that's definitely dope. And one thing this pandemic has definitely done is waking people up consciously. I think more people are getting involved. And I think sometimes, you know, as, as humans, we just get comfortable and we become vulnerable and we don't press. And I think um, now with people being a little bit more willing to be vulnerable and not being so comfortable, um, it's bringing organization, it's bringing some communication and um, able to work with you guys. So I think that's uh, pretty, pretty important. And that's some powerful stuff you behind. So definitely want to get behind you and the Office of Racial Equity and making sure that these things is actually happening because it does us no good when uh, we get, we see it from all over the place, these uh, corporate letters and different departments putting out emails saying, we support you, Black Lives Matter, we support the movement. And uh, we needed to actually be tangible where we could see it, where people are actually making change. So definitely uh, think that's important. Uh, Jada, you want to grab some more of the questions? What else do we have out there? Yeah. So um, one of the questions I have, which is also a question um, kind of similar, is uh, going into the new year, what are... Um, sorry, what are the things that you are looking forward to uh, for the whole city, for even D6? And then this kind of ties in, um, Ms. Tichel is asking, Matt, what are you doing for Christmas and Kwanzaa? So plan <laughs> looking ahead. <laughs> uh, well, for, I guess I'll start with what am I doing for Christmas and Kwanzaa um, and Hanukkah also, we're in ha Hanukkah season now. Um, unfortunately, I... Uh, I'm likely not going to see my family. Uh, my family is local. Uh, they live in San Francisco and some spread around the Bay Area. And uh, so I don't think I'm going to see them in person, unfortunately. This will probably be, well, it won't probably be. This will be my, the first time, as may be the case for many of us, in my entire life uh, that I have not been with my family for the holidays. Um, and uh, so, that, you know, but we have Zooms set up. We have Zoom celebrations like everyone else. Uh, my grandparents are 93 and 91, and my and they live in San Francisco. And my grandma is is is, is uh, my grandma's turning 91 actually uh, next week. So we'll have a Zoom party for her. And um, but it but um, yeah, it's it's a tough time, you know. I. I I've been I I I've been somewhat um, I will be honest I've been somewhat critical of the most recent health orders because I feel like it's so important for people to see their family and friends and I'm kind of frustrated that they took that that they took away our ability to do that outdoors um, I think I probably would have saw my family in some capacity in some sort of outdoor situation that now I I don't think that we can do indoors um, so. I think that's hard. So I, 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 like many people, I've experienced the, you know, the, the challenges and associated with not seeing our families, you know, that's really hard. Um, in terms of what I'm looking forward to for next year, well, first of all, I'm looking forward to 2020 being over and Donald Trump being gone, you know. <laughs> I'm looking forward to inauguration <laughs> of, uh, of a new president and vice president. Um, and, uh, and that's really, really exciting. Um, you know, I, 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 it's funny, I, I'm looking forward to having a year maybe without an election. 
uh, of any kind. You know, 2021 is not supposed to be an election year. And that would be good for, for us all to just be able to focus on the work. Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully having the vaccine come and be distributed widely and having kids be able to go back to school and um, businesses being able to reopen and, and just the work of rebuilding, uh, you know, for all the folks who have, who have suffered and sacrificed so much this year. I just want to see, you know, I want to see that, I want to see people come back. I want to see people who got hit really hard this year and who right now are, are still suffering do better next year and have the opportunity to do, to do better next year. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and the last thing I'll say, I miss seeing people, you know, I'm kind of, I'm a sort of a people person and, and, um, I miss the events. I miss the, you know, I don't know how long it will be till we, you know, give hugs again, but I miss just, you know, the, the, you know, I, I represent a community and, and, and a set of people. And it's hard for me to not in my second year in office here, representing them, not being able to be around them in the same way. Um, and learn from them and, and interact and work together. Um, that part of it is is hard. So um, I, I hope all of those, I hope 2021 brings a, a level of resurgence and and, uh, and and that we that we see people come back, you know, in a way that 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 gives us hope for where we're going. Yeah, it sounds like, uh, I don't know if it's a rumor, but it sounds like we're going to be locked down for a while uh, <laughs> going into even the new year. I think I thought I heard like 90 days or something like that. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know either. I mean, honestly, you know, it's funny. Th this time period is so strange, even for supervisors, because sometimes people like businesses will call me or whatever and be like, hey, is there going to be another lockdown? And I'm like, I, I know this is hard, hard to believe, but I have no idea. Like they don't give us like this latest, this latest lockdown that when we went to the, you know, shut down outdoor our dining and all that stuff. I found out on the day of just like everyone else. It, they, 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 they called me that morning and said they were going to make the announcement and they called the other supervisors too. Um, so uh, we, we are living in a very strange form of government right now where the people who have been elected <laughs> in some ways are also like totally in the dark because the decision is made by the public health officer oh. and and the public health officer is whatever looking at whatever data wherever and then they're they're working with the other counties and so they're sitting around with alameda and santa clara and everything and they're making a decision they're talking to the state they're not talking to me. <laughs> right, 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 right. So it's an interesting dynamic because it's like, I'm also looking forward to going back to sort of more regular democracy um, where we actually have a say in these things. It's funny, I, I, got my, I got myself into some trouble yesterday on Twitter because I, I, I sort of jokingly shared uh, some information about the new public health order, which as I understood it um, would allow would now allow, allow people to date, but only if they're outdoors and only if they're wearing a mask. And so they wouldn't be able to kiss or anything, anything like that. And so I, sh I shared this on Twitter. <laughs> all, of these, all of these people came and shared and, and from all over the country and they were attacking me and everything and saying, this is so evil that, you know, you all are fascist and totalitarian society that, and, and I was like, well, first of all, I was kind of sharing it because I thought it was pretty silly. Um, not because I supported it. <laughs> Secondly, I had nothing to do with creating these rules. I know it's hard to believe because I'm an elected part of the government, but I had no say in it. I mean, it's not right. something that I vote on or anything like that. They, those rules around what's shut down and when, I have no say in generally, if it's a public health order. And, and neither did the rest of the board of supervisors. Well, I would, like to, I would like to personally collaborate with you on something. I don't know what, but just collaborate, do something and bring, and yeah. bring the two communities together i guess maybe we need to get dean on here next yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I'm you see how john laughed yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's I my mean, guy that's my guy yeah yeah it's funny i um i lived in d5 uh before i lived in d6 oh uh, wow uh i lived in d5 for probably about seven years i was i was there for a while okay um, 
uh, I, first place I lived in San Francisco was here in D6, and then I lived in, in D5 for a while. Um, and that's also how I knew I know uh, Mayor Breed really well from, from that as well. We were uh, worked very closely together, um, and uh, and 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 Director Davis as well um, was very involved in, in in the community there. So, um, but uh, yeah, then I then I I was in the Tenderloin and. Um, uh, Sharon Hewitt, uh, some folks may know Sharon Hewitt. Yeah, yeah, Sharon, yeah, yeah. Sharon Hewitt told me I had to run for supervisor and <laughs> forced me to do it and told me that the Tenderloin was was the, the place that most represented uh, sort of the diversity and and what made her hopeful about the city. And uh, I, I came to share that that as well. So she she lived it went in her in her in her older years she lived on on uh, Taylor Street on uh, Curran House Eddie and Taylor and uh, definitely I, I definitely want to collaborate I don't know what it's going to be but I'll definitely reach out and, and figure something out because I yeah. know you definitely have a very diverse community down there and yeah I would I love to talk with Rudy Corpus and all those folks down there and yeah Cole Tenderloin and all them so. Yeah, no, and, and, and definitely, Matt, you know, we just want to let the people know, too, even with the challenges and the things that's going on financially with the pandemic and just the other stuff that's going on outside, there are still some amazing people doing amazing work in the community. And, you know, we, we don't want to let that go without seeing definitely um, the Human Rights Commu Commission, what Cheryl Davis and them is doing, a lot of the nonprofits. I'm out in the streets. People are getting fed, you know, and one thing I have to say with the leadership of the mayor, the supervisor of the city, our districts are getting food, they're getting COVID testing. So, you know, there is a level of urgency that is happening and we just want to let the people know that it is things coming to the community. We're going to work better to get the communication to the community. There's some help and things that's happening. And um, there's some amazing individuals doing great things. So we just want to definitely keep that out there. And I know, Matt, you part of it and you show it in your action about being out there with the people. So just want to make sure that we keep that out there, because I know some people we're in this gloom and doom moment and a lot of people are, you know, anxiety and they just thinking that, you know, nobody's there to care about them. And I just want to let them know that our elected officials in San Francisco, I've been to other cities. They are doing the they are doing an amazing job making sure that people are getting something and helping out and making sure that it's going because there's some cities out there that I know is not doing so well at it. So we got to give our San Francisco elected officials uh, a round of applause, especially, uh, you know, what Cheryl Davis name is doing. They are making impact and we are getting people getting resources to the community. And we just have to be patient and work together. But I definitely want to make sure that we focus on our seniors and our young people. And I know, Matt, you've been on the school board um, with this Zoom school. Me and Rico work with a lot of youth. Um, some of our youth in the black and brown community are struggling with this uh, new education type. Um, you know, how close are we to getting something going with getting our kids back in school? They need the social experience. And I think a lot of the other parents in the community has been frustrated because a lot of the private schools are in the city. They are um, having their kids go to school while a lot of the black and brown uh, children are at Zoom school and the school district is closed down. How do we get the school district moving? Um, you know, I know this pandemic had, has hit everybody by surprise um, and it definitely our emergency ma management uh, system has definitely been challenged. And I hope through this pandemic, uh, instead of complaining about all the things, we actually look at the things that failed when it's over and really tighten up as a country, you know, because I, I just feel like even if it was an earthquake, um, are we really ready? You know, a lot of times we have classes and training and everybody's getting ready and we don't have the real data or we don't have the real experience to test that to make sure it's actually working. And um, I think this pandemic has taught us that we, we have our shortcomings and we need to close that lap. But when it comes to school, Matt, what do you think? We got to get our kids back to school. Uh, the, the social experiences of our, of our young people, they losing it. How do we get, you know, get get the school district, get get some things moving and, and get, get our children back into these schools? Well, you know, first of all, on your on your, on your first point, I, I have been incredibly inspired by the way that people have stepped up during this pandemic. And uh, there are so many things that have happened and people are working harder and in different and challenging circumstances. Uh, and so that has given me a lot of hope as well. I see you guys out there all the time. Um, and, and it, you know, in, in, in reality, this is 
this is what all of us, as you talked about, like the trainings and the preparation, and all that. This is this is the moment. Like anybody who views themselves as a leader or somebody who cares about other people, this is game time. Like this year was game time, and we all had to step step up. And I remember actually the first like week or two, I was a little like frozen at first because I was like, "Is this hap- You know, is this happening?" Like, and I was kind of overwhelmed sort of, of what my responsibility was in this in this moment in this year and I think you know it's like you know, we shook it off and then we got we got in and so uh, there were so many examples of that you know you talked about United players and this is connected to your your question about schools you know early on United players just started to basically operate their own school <laughs> um, you know in the absence of school being open and down at, at, at the Soma uh, Rec Center, and um, and uh, um, and 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 that uh, that building now is a community hub, and we have opportunities for young people in the absence of of schools being open to be able to go in and actually have some support from adults, and they still have to do Zoom school, but they're there with adults, and we basically, you know with the leadership of the mayor and DCYF and, and we helped fund it at the board. We've been able to step in in some ways, especially for some of the students who, who are most vulnerable and in Soma and the Tenderloin, we have that operating at a number of, of, of places. But in, at the end of the day, nothing is a real, is a substitute for school it's, itself. And students are falling behind. There's deep impacts on their mental well-being, their physical and emotional, emotional well-being, even bes- beyond you know being behind in, in the actual academics so we finally ha- have been able to get a timeline from the school district uh, around reopening um, you know it's definitely not going to make everyone happy or maybe anyone happy because unfortunately it doesn't it doesn't bring middle and high school students back at all this year they are going to be at zoom for the rest of the, the year and part of that is is because i think that the, the, the level of, of spread that can exist among high school and, and, and in some cases middle school students is just too, too high, the risk of it. And so, and even in a lot of other cities like New York and such, they've opened for elementary schools, but not for middle and high schools. And then for, for elementary schools, TK through second grade will come back for most students in March. So again, not, not as quickly as I think, but there's, you know, I chair our joint committee with the school district and there definitely has a lot of things that they have to figure out. So I do want to have some empathy and support for them. You know, young, kids wearing masks and distance and, you know, and then having testing of teachers and it's, you know, it is, it's not simple. And I will say for the school district, they're not really built to do this, right? They're not health experts. <laughs> like they're not, they're like, so wait, now in addition to teaching kids, you have, we have to like understand how to do testing for COVID and check people's symptoms, right? It's like, it's, it's like everybody's doing just something more. And in schools, the teacher was already a social worker, you know, a nurse, everything. And now they have to, you know, separate people for, for COVID symptoms. You know, it's just a lot. So they are pulling it together. What I will say though, on all of this is that we are going to have to work so much harder to make up for the loss that young people experienced during this year. Because even when they come back, they lost a year. Uh, And there's also even more than losing that year for some students, some students did okay with Zoom, but most, you know, it's mixed. The emotional, mental health, all of that is also like really deep impact. So we're gonna have to be there for, 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 for the kids in a way even more so even when they come back, we're gonna have consequences and ripple effects of this year for years and years and years to come. Um, and it's not like the schools were already, you know, or our system was already serving all of the kids as much as, as, as it should have. Um, but I will just say the educators and the teachers, many of them, most of them are just doing incredible work right now. Like I've, I've watched some of these Zoom classes where the teachers are trying to engage everyone and they're, they're checking in on them and they're making calls afterwards. And then they have their own kids. It's, it's just, um, you know, the dedication of educators is just like extraordinary. Um, and it's not fair to them either, but um, 
so we they want to get back in too as soon as it's safe yeah definitely definitely and uh I, i'm gonna let jada go ahead we close this 10 minutes closing out so we'll go to jada she has the last closing question and we'll get rico's um, but definitely infrastructure is something we're going to have to look at in the future for our kids um, i talked to a lot of the parents in d10 uh, D6, some of the areas, um, the Wi-Fi and cell towers and things of that nature, getting our babies access has been a challenge too. So I just hope that, um, you know, that's something that's thrown in to remember because a lot of people in these communities are stru struggling with connectivity issues and, and having Wi-Fi and having those telecommunication uh, availability and access for them. So definitely, I want to make sure we, we definitely, when you're talking about that, think about that, because I know some of the people in the community are definitely, you start getting up into the hills of Hunter's Point and some of these other areas, uh, the communication and, 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 and the cell towers and, and Wi-Fi is just poor for our young people. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, um, I don't have any further questions and I know we're about four minutes away, um, but I'll just say thank you. It's It's been great having you on, especially being a resident of D6. Completely love all the work that's being done and really like truly how open you are to communicating um, with, with not only D6, but so many other districts. Um, so super appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Same. Thank you. Go ahead, Rico, you want to close out? Yeah, I just want to say thank you once again uh, for coming out, showing your support to both sides of the conversation and willing to answer all questions on both sides of the conversation. Truly appreciate you. Um, definitely looking forward to working with you and developing and creating as much as we possibly can. Um, it has been an amazing show. Uh, John, thank you so much. You know, I mean, I see you spiffy, you know, uh, <laughs> I, when I when I first tuned in, I was like, "Oh man, should I change?" Like, you guys are all looking good. So. I'm not definitely, man. I re, you know concur with all of them, Matt. You know, thanks for coming on. Thanks for being a pillar in the community, a leader. You know, working with Damien, us for us, working with Kaim over at City Eats. You know, working with the different organizations, coming to the community, letting the people see you out there actually doing it. Um, definitely just appreciate you giving up this time. Hopefully you don't feel like you was beat up too bad. It's both sides of the conversation, but uh, I, just, I, I just hope the 49ers are doing okay. They're, <laughs> they're no, not. <laughs> You're not missing nothing. They're not. <laughs> But, um, you know, we really appreciate you. And I mean, this is what it's all about. And I know we have a lot of new people. You know, it's not about tearing each other down here at both sides of the conversation. We are definitely trying to tap into difficult conversations um, because I think, you know, I, I hear a lot of we, we want to reimagine and make things how it used to be. And I think really in our communities right now, we need to have the difficult conversation. I think that's what we're bringing here. Uh, we have to normalize the difficult conversations and, and, and the constructive criticism and the things of that nature, right? Because we only gonna get better through those conversations and healing. Um, so just appreciate you coming and being open, man. I think that's what people need. Um, and I think that's the starting process of connectivity with community and city officials. And here at both sides of the conversation, again, we're just trying to be one of the hubs of information to the community. There's many ways that people are communicating, but I think as we build the relationships, you know, when you guys have important things going on, we could definitely be that hub to help get that uh, information to our community because we connected with a lot of people in the San Francisco uh, city and um, the community, we, they need this information. And um, it's sometimes that's just the gap um, of success and not, and just being intentional and getting the information. Cause I think that that's, that's what's holding sometimes that gap being bridged is just the information. If people know being a little intentional uh, ahead of time when we're presenting things to the community and making sure that the people that we sit in the community is, is, is on the same page and message of unity <laughs> and togetherness, you know what I mean? So that's a big fight, but uh, thank you again for coming on. Uh, you guys, this was an amazing conversation uh, with, with uh, Matt Haney here from San Francisco Supervisor doing amazing things. We just want to thank him again for coming on, upcoming here at both sides of the conversation. You guys know we're doing our three shows. We're moving, things are happening. This Tuesday, we're going to have our amazing two guests. We're going to have uh, San Francisco Francisco Mayor London Breed, and we're going to have Cheryl Davis, Commissioner from the Human Rights Commission on, and they're going to come in and we're going to highlight them as hidden gems in our community. That's that's our hidden gem segment, and we want to make sure that they're coming on. We're here to give them their flowers. We're here to show them love and respect for all the amazing things that they're doing, um, and they're coming in our hidden gem segment, and I think it's going to be important, um, and, and they'll give a uh, uh, have a time to talk directly to our community 
Um, so looking forward to that Tuesday. This Thursday, we have another educational pr presentation coming in um, that's going to teach us some amazing things. And that's what we're just trying to provide here. All you professionals out there that want to educate the community, want to get involved and give back to the community. You have a PowerPoint presentation. You have some information for uh, the community reach out to us uh, both sides of the conversation at gmail we want to get you on our platform we want to be intentional with our education making sure that our people are getting information that's needed and i'm um, definitely with the sister coming on this week talking about insurance is important because in our community life insurance and all insurances are important and we need to push that promote that and uh, make that happen and then the following week uh next sunday's conversation to all the ladies out there our single mom our co-parenting moms and our married moms who are raising kids and want to talk about your experience and uh, some of the struggles and some of the goods, the bads um, that, that our men need to hear. We want you guys to tune in. We, are, we have a, a lot of panelists who reached out, but if you want to be a panelist and a part of that conversation, please reach out to us at both sides of the conversation at Gmail. We're going to have an amazing sister on here and maybe uh, some other people that's going to facilitate and uh, make sure that you sister voices are heard, the things that you guys are struggling with, um, that that information get across to our brothers in the community. And then the last Sunday of the month after Christmas, we're going to have our moms and our dads come together here on both sides of the conversation. And then we're going to take the two uh, different experiences, bring them together and come with a healing process, come with a solution, how to co-parent, how to parent and how to make the uh, experience for our young people from both parents a priority and important. So I think that's gonna be critical conversations coming up here in the future. Um, looking forward to having you guys here. Um, again, both sides of the conversation at all social media handles. Go to our YouTube. You can see some of our previous conversations if you're trying to get caught up and see what's going on. Um, that's where all our information will be there as well as our Facebook group. Thank you guys for everybody tuning in today. I'm sure there'll be some questions coming on. We'll replay it and um, we'll definitely get those questions out to Matt, Shaman, whoever else um, that's needed. So thank you guys for tuning in today. See you on Tuesday. Have a blessed one and uh, stay safe out there, everybody.